I think it's safe to say that no other cocktail brings with it as much mystery and romance as the martini. Famed in song and story, the martini stands alone as the quintessential American cocktail. Unlike its crystal clear appearance, the martini's origins are a bit uh, murky. One popular tale tells of the martini being invented by a bartender by the name of Jerry Thomas, originally from New Haven, Connecticut, while he was working at the Occidental Hotel in San Francisco, California. He is said to have named the cocktail the Martinez. And although no verifiable proof or date has ever been attached to this story, one thing we can tell you is that in 1862, Mr. Thomas published with great success a manual for bartenders entitled The Bartender's Guide. The book was reprinted several times, and in the 1887 edition, a recipe was included for the Martinez cocktail. Now this, of course, hardly resembles the martini of today. Another version comes from the town of Martinez, California, where the residents claim that in 1870, a miner stopped at a bar on Ferry Street that was owned by one Julio Richelieu. The miner threw a small sack of gold on the counter and asked for a bottle of whiskey. When the miner announced that he was not quite satisfied with what he was given, Mr. Richelieu took a small glass, whipped him up a drink, and garnished it with an olive. When asked by the miner what this concoction was called, Richelieu announced, it's a Martinez. And if you take a trip today to the town of Martinez, California, and go to the corner of Alhambra and Masonic, you will see a brass plaque declaring Martinez, California as the official birthplace of the martini. Others say that the drink was named after an Italian bartender who worked at the Knickerbocker Hotel in 1911, while the British claim that the martini's name is derived from the Martini and Henry rifle used by the British Army as early as 1871. The Oxford English Dictionary claims the earliest use of the word martini was in 1894, when it was used in an advertisement for Hublin's Club Cocktails, which was a line of pre-mixed drinks. And some say that the name was taken from Martini and Rossi Dry Vermouth. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. Its history is hard to nail down. When making the perfect martini, the first thing to consider is the glass. The trend today seems to be for martinis to be served up supersized in glasses so big you could almost bathe in them. I almost weep every time I see this. Forget for a moment the elegance of a small glass or its ties to the past and the martini's rich history. Above all things, a martini is made to be consumed cold. And unless you are engaged in some sort of a chug -a -lug contest, it is not possible, when given a martini large enough to float a battleship in, to finish it before its temperature has risen to almost tropical levels. The small glass gives you the opportunity to enjoy a martini, first sip to last, the way it was meant to be. Cold. The glass we like to use has a maximum capacity of 4.5 ounces. This size glass holds a lovely 3.5 ounce cocktail and looks great doing so. The second very important thing to remember is that your glasses must be kept in the freezer. If you plan on shaking up a fine cocktail and then putting it into anything less than a well chilled glass, <laughs> you might as well just pour the contents of the shaker down the drain. In a future episode, we will be exploring the martini glass in much more depth. But for our purposes today, we have chosen a Libby's circa 1940s Stardust martini glass, which, by the way, Cary Grant and Deborah Carr used in the 1957 movie, An Affair to Remember. At the five o'clock hour, we have always preferred shaking a martini as opposed to stirring. Having tried both, we simply feel that this method renders a better cocktail. Today we have chosen a silver seven ounce circa 1950 Gorham cobbler style shaker. When mixing up a single cocktail, the smaller the shaker, the better. Next, the gin. In future episodes, we will be talking about specific gins, but for today, we have chosen one of my personal favorites, Beefeater's London Dry, recognized by many as the classic London Dry Gin. Our preference for vermouth today is Nolly Pratt. Keep in mind that vermouth is a wine-based product and should be refrigerated after opening. It's at this point that we add approximately two and one half ounces of gin to our shaker, followed by a splash of vermouth. This will yield a finished cocktail of approximately 3.5 ounces. Next, we pick out a nice, fresh, ripe lemon, giving it a quick rinse under some cold water and taking our sharpest paring knife, gently slice off a generous sized peel. 
Next, we add a healthy amount of ice to our shaker. Placing on the top, we agitate it briskly using wrist action until the outside of the shaker gets so cold as to be uncomfortable to hold. We then pull out our martini glass that has been waiting patiently for us in the freezer and slowly pour the contents of the shaker into the glass. The liquid from the shaker must be cloudy when poured, not unlike that of a dense English fog. If the liquid coming forth from the shaker is clear, then you have not shaken it enough. We then take our lemon peel and holding it approximately two inches above the surface of the liquid, we give it a good slow twist, thus releasing all of the rich flavorful oils to float gently on the surface. We then place the peel gently into the liquid. You are now ready for that first glorious sip of a true American classic, the martini. So please, join us each week as the five o'clock hour explores the history, the rituals, the gadgets and gizmos, the techniques, the recipes, the food, the drink, and all of the other wonderful and interesting things that make up this truly unique institution that we here call the five o'clock hour. Or visit us anytime at the five o'clock hour.com. And please remember, enjoy the five o'clock hour responsibly. Until we meet again, Cheers.